best-selling author and researcher. Daniel Estelin is an amazing uh, individual, and he's written the uh, Bilderberg uh, Club book, the true story of the Bilderberg Group that became the international bestseller in more than 30 countries. DanielEstelin.com, and he's got a new film out as well, or coming out. And, of course, he got even more famous when Fidel Castro invited him to Cuba to talk about his book. And it doesn't mean he's bad. If Fidel Castro invited me to go speak to him, I'd go say I disagree with communism, but I'd talk to him. It's just interesting. Uh, Daniel Estlin's obviously had a big effect is the point. And I happen to know of two of his sources into Bilderberg. We have some of our sources that are on the edge of Bilderberg. A lot of what they say ends up in public statements, but, but kind of shaded. Uh, but he really has given us a lot of information over the years that two, three years later happens exactly as he said. Here's an example. He said they're going to implode the housing market in two years to consolidate power and to start a new bubble. He said that in 2006. It happened in 2008. Exactly as he said. That's because he's not looking into a crystal ball. The Bilderberg Group is at the very top of these globalist power structures. And so he joins us in hindsight, to get into from his sources what was on the agenda uh, this year and how things are going for them, uh, what they think about the euro being in trouble with the EU, uh, crisis with Greece, England wanting to have a vote to get out. Uh, they always said they couldn't survive exposure. Are they in trouble or are they stronger than ever? Daniel Estelin of DanielEstelin.com, thank you for coming on. Alex, it's always a pleasure to be on your show. I always feel at home and uh, very welcome, and uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, and uh, yes, indeed, I uh, I was in uh, at the Bilderberg conference. I didn't make it too close to the actual events. Um, we actually stayed in Innsbruck. Our sources on the inside, the same sources, which extend of the original document from October 2014, um, um, telling us about the actual site of the meeting in June of this year. They warned us a couple of weeks ago, saying that they are on the lookout for you. If you actually get there, they'll do everything in their power to make sure you go. So we stayed in uh, in Innsbruck, and our people, uh, cameramen incognito, actually went over. They didn't tell anybody they're part of our group, and that's the information. The last little bit we're going to be putting into a documentary. But that said, we certainly have a lot of information from this year's meeting. As you know, our sources, they're always there. They never fail with the information, and. Uh, it's been a very interesting slog, I have to say that. And uh, I've been also following what your guys have been saying, and uh, a lot of great information. So I'm very, very grateful to be back on your show. Well, thank you. Well, you've got some of the best sources out there, quite frankly, inside Bilderberg. We just have them on the edge of Bilderberg. Uh, how are things going for them? What's the mood? What was the theme? Uh, and, and what are they going to be pushing? Well, you know, I think they're very concerned. You have to say, if you're looking at the... Uh, at the agenda this year, and also if you're looking at the actual list of the attendees, it was, a, you know, pound for pound, I'd say, you know, it, it was certainly one of the stronger pound for pound lists over the last 10 years or so. There were lots of, you know, presidents and prime ministers from, you know, northern uh, European countries, you know, Finland, uh, uh, Sweden, Denmark, that kind of stuff. And also uh, some notable uh, 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 missing individuals, uh, as was the case with uh, uh, Christine Lagarde, the president of the International Monetary Fund. She wasn't there, which only goes to show you and basically tells me from what we're getting is that there's going to be some changes at the International Monetary Fund on the one hand, and also the fact is that the United States, which is basically you know the, the principal you know, purveyor of, of the International Monetary Fund's uh, power in the world, is also losing some of its grip uh, at the expense of some of these other groups, such as you know BRICS, the uh, the new Asian investment bank, and so on and so forth. So there's going to be you know obviously there's going to be some movement over the next little while, and that's one of the reasons why Lagarde wasn't there. I don't know if she's going to be able you know to remain in her position or they're going to, you know, get rid of her and put someone else in their place. But certainly that, uh, you know, tells me a lot about the fact that, you know, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, uh, European Central Bank, Federal Reserve, these are, you know, 100% attendees at every Bilderberg meeting. And the fact is that the International Monetary Fund's president is not there. It's the first in a very, very long time. What about the unprecedented security? I mean, I know that Tucker got shot at. You've had him try to kill you. We're not being dramatic. There's a reason you stay back. They really are scared of you because they know you've got some sources inside. Uh, they absolutely hate your guts. They raided Charlie Skelton. Um, our guys were threatened some. I've had my family death threatened when I covered Bilderberg, when Hillary Clinton and Obama were there. Uh, they were actually listening to our phones and then calling up my wife, calling up family and, and making threats and saying, we just listened to you and repeating it back to freak them out. 
that tended to be a particularly important one in 2008, you noted. Uh, this one seemed, just for me watching afar with our reporters, to be ultra important. I've never seen them put a cordon back six miles, Daniel. Oh, you know, that's absolutely right. You know, one of the reasons, they actually, they started doing this back in 2007, the last year where you had, you know, fairly easy access or close enough, you actually, you know, get them with a, you know, with, with a nice big long lens. It was in 2006 when you came to Canada, to Canada on the outskirts of Ottawa. Before that, Jim and I were basically the only people going to these meetings. And when my book came out in the United States, and, you know, and everybody had a chance to see these photographs, which looked like it was taken, like, you know, literally from two meters away. Of course, they weren't, but it looked like it. These people realized that they need to do something with the security and then, you know, with the, with the onslaught of, of uh, online media and, you know, social media, media, it just became impossible for these people, you know, to keep this information, you know, under the list. So they started pushing this thing further and further back. And then this year, you're absolutely right. You know, they certainly got a little bit, you know, out of hand in this sense. But also what would really surprise me, especially when I, what I saw back in October 2014, the document where, you know, the interior ministry uh, basically telling all their people the vacation period for the June month of June is off the charts because the Bilderbergers are coming to town. What surprised me is the fact that these people are actually having their meeting uh, in June because usually it's, uh, you know, it could be late April at the earliest and usually sometime in May, May 15, 20. That's just about the time when you actually look at the agendas of the last 10, 20, 30 years. That's just about, you know, the right time for them to have the meeting. And the fact is that back in October, they knew that this year's meeting is going to be held in June. Told me that a lot of very important things are going to be happening in June because obviously, you know, if they hold the meeting in May and then stuff happens in June, it certainly doesn't make any sense. And the first thing that obviously happened, you had a G7 meeting just, you know, literally hours or days before the Bilderberg conference. But then when you look at the other stuff, and there's some of the things that, you know, they talked about and some of the things that, you know, we, we've got from, from our sources uh, who basically said the reasons are the following. You know, there's a, there's an Austrian mortgage bank with a very funny name by the name of Ipo Alpe Adria. Yeah, try saying that 10 times, okay? And they have to make a, you know, smallish payment of 500 million euros, uh, you know, as a result of what basically happened when the Swiss deep the franc and, you know, revalued their currency, like, you know, 30% in, in 10 minutes. And so that's one of the things that happened. Uh, the southern province of Carinthia, uh, you know, backed away from, you know, pledges previously made by saying that we simply can't pay what the money of the money that we owe. And, you know, an important understanding is how all of these banks basically own each other's debt. In other words, the cross ownership, quote unquote, of debt means that when one goes down, it will, you know, basically provoke a chain reaction of all the other banks going down. And well this isn't a you know a huge trigger, this Ipo Alpi Adria, you know, it's a little bank. The fact is is that all of Eastern Europe can and will be affected and uh, you know, but what originally was from, you know, the Swiss depegging the franc from the euro and, you know, with a system as illiquid as it is today, there's no telling how far, you know, this thing could reverberate. And of course, you have, you have Greece, which just recently missed the, uh, on June the 5th, the deadline, you know, for the payment, which was 320 billion euros. The money they simply don't have, and they said, you know, we're not going to print it, and we can't, you know, we're not going to pay it, and we certainly can't print it. And so the only thing is left is for them to default and fall into the open arms of Russia and China. And, you know, yesterday, the day before, right after the Bilderberg meeting finished, all of the European uh, newspapers in Italy, in France, in Germany, in Spain, they all basically you said the same thing. If Greece walks, you know, gets out of the euro and um, defaults on its debt, you know, there's going to be a meeting in Brussels where jointly they're going to decide to close the banks and give us all a haircut. Anybody who holds more than 100,000 euros is going to be having to pay 10% of that money towards the bail-in and anything under is going to be 6.75%, which isn't new. It's, you know, it's, it all comes back from the, uh, from, uh, 2011 and the, and, you know, the, the whole Cyprus fiasco. But it just goes to tell you and to show you how a lot of this stuff is actually you know, playing itself out. You can, you know, you talk about Ukraine, international monetary fund thing to, you know, restructure ten billion dollars worth of, you know, worth yeah, of Ukrainian debt. You know, and that kind of stuff. Not to mention something else which was very, very interesting and again. Well, well hold on, know, Daniel. I we've got it. a we've got to go to break. We come back. I want to get into that next point you were about to hit and I want to ask you this other question. You mentioned the banks and and, and, and the corruption of who was there. HSBC with you know all these admissions of fixing rates and laundering money. You had the heads of HSBC, three of them there, top people with the regulators from the EU, 
and the Exchequer head, which regulates it in the UK. I mean, that right there is so illegal, so flagrant. Uh, they seem to be so bold. We'll talk about that with Daniel Estelin straight ahead. Fighting out in California. And then Greeks refuse to pay debt, declared illegal, illegitimate, and, quote, odious. Other nations set to follow suit. That's some of the news up on Infowars.com. Customer claims KFC served him fried rat. Well, that's going to be healthier than the chicken soaked in MSG. So you ought to be happy. Uh, privacy expert, time-traveling robots could punish future crime. D Daniel, um, how is their agenda going, of course? And when you got cut off from the break, you were trying to get into something you were saying that was that was really, really important. Go ahead. It's, it's, you know, it's a very interesting point when you kind of look at the stuff, you know, from your know, bird's eye view and you see how these things kind of work together. For example, very, very, you know, just a few days before the Bilderberg conference, uh, Russian government via Russian newspaper Pravda announced Chinese gold holdings of 30,000 tons. Now, if you kind of think about it, you say, what the hell? That doesn't make any sense. Why would a Russian newspaper, obviously working together with the Russian government, announce something, you know, as far as Chinese gold holdings, unless the Chinese and the Russians are working together using Russian newspaper Pravda to get the information out and actually pressure the Bilderberg some way because again it's, you know the timing is interesting and you know to rehash this Pravda you know they've released this article they won't do this without Moscow's permission and so would Moscow have given them permission without the approval from Beijing when these two are working together obviously not and what does that have to do with you know Kerry Obama uh, you know Kerry going meeting Putin uh, not long ago in Sochi because that's an about face you know about the current policy of the United States and so when you kind of look at this whole thing you know, gold is a financial thermonuclear weapon. I mean, you've been talking about gold deposits for a very, very long time. And you know, this is the kind of stuff that can actually destroy the fiat currency system of the West. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise, I think, anyone who really understands how things work. You know, if Washington was giving the courtesy, so to speak, of a heads up, you know, to some sort of, you know, coming announcement, even if a smaller sum than, you know, sure. 30,000 tons, which is a hell of a lot of, you know, tons of gold. And so when you kind of look at this, and uh, you know, this announcement by China, it raises the questions of Western holdings, which, of course, brings Western currencies into question. Sure, well, we've seen them and manipulating again, that with tungsten and, 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 and naked shorting. What does it signify in Spain that they're talking about restricting sales of gold? I mean, that's got to show you that they're really worried about gold. Well, it basically tells you that you know the the, the whole thing is uh, you know is uh, is uh, is 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 done. If you look at what's actually going on in Europe over the last few days, uh, uh, France, Germany, Austria, Italy, they have closed down their borders. Alex, this whole Schengen Treaty in Europe, which basically created this one united borderless Europe, that's dead. You have. Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of immigrants coming into Italy. Tens of thousands that are coming into, uh, into France. You know, you have uh, about 50,000, 60,000 over the last few months have entered Germany. And so the European nations are saying we've had enough. And so the European Central Authority, which is European Parliament and European Union, they have completely lost control and are losing power. And this is one of the reasons why we're seeing some of these, you know, shakeups on the European supranational level. And that goes, goes to show you that, you know, if France shut down the border, you know, coming back from 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 uh, from Innsbruck, we had to go through France. And when I actually got to France, that's all part of the European Union. For the first time in I think like ten years, I had to show my passport. Usually, I just show my residency permit from from Spain, and that's enough. Well, they asked me and they insisted on the passport. And if they didn't have a passport, they wouldn't let me into the country. Do you know what I mean? So this is the first. So time their borders are going right back now. up, which signifies the euro is beginning to break up. Which I know the globalists plan to build it then suck everybody dry, then implode it, but have it fold into a new supranational global government as the bubble. Is it going according to plan, or is it gyrating out of control? Is globalism in trouble? If globalism is in trouble, because, you know, for the first time, and I know we've talked about this last year and the year before, you know, to what point are these people controlling, you know, the financial meltdown? Well, I can tell you this. You know, they're controlling it, but they're not controlling it as they would have, you know, liked to have controlled it. Because one of the strong sentiments amongst the Bilderbergers this year 
is that the United States dollar may not survive. And so what they're simply doing is they're cashing out. And you see this cashing out process on the world stage. And, you know, as the year winds down over the last, you know, six months of the year, it, it's going to be a very messy, very chaotic and, you know, very important, you know, period in the demise of, of you know, the current economic situation that sure. we're living through. And if you kind of go back over the past, I don't know, 40, 50 years or so, every seven years, there's some kind of a thing going on which makes you wonder, you know, what's going on in the world. In 1973, Arab oil embargo. 1980, you remember gold and silver Hunt Brothers peak? Then in 87, you have the Black Monday. 94, you have the famous irrational uh, exuberance with the ensuing Asian meltdown. The 2001, you have the inside 9-11 job. 2008, the Lehman Brothers failures, you know, followed by the... We're set you know, for another one. Exactly, and the year 2015 will be known for the United States dollar. I'll tell you what, Daniel, uh, d do five more minutes with us. you got to finish with this bombshell info, then we're going to get other guests on. This is huge. We're on the mark. All saying that a massive, massive meltdown is coming, much bigger than 2008. And now it's in the news today. The next great European financial crisis has begun. Um, Business Insider, Greeks are stashing tens of thousands of bundles of euros in their homes ahead of a bank bail-in when they grab your bank account. UK draws up contingency plans as Bank of Greece warns of uncontrollable crisis. I mean, this is big. London Guardian, it's going to be bad. Whatever happens, Greece on the edge of Eurozone exit looms. And then you've got the banks all admitting that they're fixing the interest rates, money laundering, manipulating currencies, manipulating stock markets. I was talking to a very successful hedge fund manager who got bought out a few years ago, but it was a major company, billions of dollars. Off record, uh, ran into him and then looked up who he was, and sure enough, he was who he said he was. A uh, pretty famous guy. I knew I'd see him on TV and stuff. And we were in a restaurant, he came over and like talked to him about 10 minutes Tried to buy me a drink and stuff. And I'm detoxing, so, I, you know, it was none of that. And he was just scared. And I told you about billionaires five years ago that I talked to who were leaving to New Zealand. I told you James Cameron really left because he's scared. Now that's admitted. I mean, I didn't just say that. I knew somebody that knows him well. And Daniel Eslin's on with us. I know he's for real. I know his sources. And he's saying, it's the seven-year cycle. Is it artificial? Is it there? Get to where you say this is going because all the experts, we have the experts on that are right. That's what we have you on. We appreciate you coming on. DanielEslin.com, best-selling author, joins us, researcher, Bilderberg investigative journalist. But it, it seems like this new bubble so much bigger than the others. Am I right in saying this could be spectacular? And how bad could it be? Uh, I know you got to go, Daniel, so five minutes. What else do you want to impart to folks? Well, you know, it could be spectacular in the sense that you have gold right now at $1,200, $1,300 an ounce. Well, it could very well go to about fifty or $60,000 an ounce very shortly. And it's not me saying it. Bloomberg came out and said that, you know, shortly just, you know, before the Bilderberg conference. So I know this was on the agenda. And when we're talking about, you know, the dollar collapsing and Bilderberg is understand this and they're cashing out. Or the Bilderberg, or Bloomberg, which is Bilderberg and mainstream, they're talking about this thing actually going to fifty, sixty thousand dollars an ounce. You know, my guess is that Bloomberg has some type of information that China is going to announce their holdings in gold, which means that they have ten thousand tons or twenty or thirty, as what uh, Russian Pravda said. So, what does that mean for the United States? Well, basically, what it means that after the announcement is made, you know, all the gold holdings. People are going to say, hey, wait a minute, where did these people get the gold from? Well, the obvious answer is from Western vaults and the biggest Western vault of the United States. So the marketplace will make a judgment between wow. the yuan, the Chinese currency, and the dollar. And, you know, so does that mean that Americans are going to, you know, voluntarily audit mm. their, you know, gold, gold holdings? Obviously not. But the market is going to make them because basically the marketplace will say, you don't audit, or we'll keep selling the dollars. And so basically, we could very much be looking at this massive implosion over the next few months. And the Russians and the Chinese, they haven't pulled the trigger to this point in all this, you know, um, in-your-face provocation by the West and the United States, because they weren't quite set up, but they are set up now. And I think we'll be seeing, as you said, September. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing, too, from a lot of people. So if September comes, you know, <laughs> start building your no art now. You still have a little bit of time left. Well, I tell you, Daniel Estelin, you look at the provocative moves against Russia, 
China's engaged in some of their own provocative moves, but the West has as well. I'd say that's 50-50 blame. But I look at the Western establishment. Our elites have never acted this reckless. I've never been to Russia. I don't have a dog in the fight. But I don't want to start fights with people. And I can't see geopolitically how destabilizing Poland, Ukraine, uh, and the Caucasus helps the Euro, the West, anybody. I mean, we are truly, our elites in our name are cut and dry bad guys. There's really no way to change that. Russia is, is now allied with Egypt, allied with Greece, allied China, was bigger enemies with them than us. They're now buddy-buddy. Uh, the globalists have taken America's soft power and SH, you know what, it did away, down the toilet. Our elites are super smart, as you know. There's got to be some larger plan. Why would they be destroying our name, risking World War III, and acting so crazy? Or is it megalomania like Napoleon and Hitler got? Do they really think they're invincible? Do they have an ace in the hole or, or, or a bevy of aces, a stable of aces, uh, an arsenal of aces that we don't know about? I don't think so. I think it's the question is, it's, it's the British Empire. And what basically happens is that they're going down. The economic cycle is going down. You know, the, the, the system is down, is itself is, is, is putrid, and that's, that's about to be, you know, blown out. And so they're willing to destroy the entire world in order to save themselves. Of course, they're also going to go down. There are a lot of unknowns right now. And the only thing we do know is that if this thing gets started anywhere in the world, it's going to get really, really bad. And you're talking about nuclear nations, not just the United States, you know, uh, projecting its weakness here or there against a weaker opponent, be it Iraq or Afghanistan or, you know, or Grenada. No, we're talking about China, we're talking about Russia, we're talking about India, Pakistan, North Korea. And if you get into these shooting wars and these kinds of things, the odds are it's going to go sure. nuclear. And if it's going nuclear, we all go into hell. Well, Mark Dice did a video where 80% of the people, the, the, oh, eight out of ten people, said, let's nuke Russia so we're superior. That, they went and talked to Russians, did the same thing. They all freaked out and said, what are you crazy, and almost attacked the cameraman because that's a sane response to insanity, and I'm not glorifying the Russians, but what happened to Americans, especially so-called liberals, that they're in this trance because they think the word liberal lets them act like fascist, what happened to the Republican Party trying to sign the TPP? I mean, there really is a collective insanity in the West right now. You know, basically, Alex, like, you know, in the United States, the top two areas where the government is spending most of its money, the first is obvious, it's military. But you know what the second is? Fighting the discontent of the public. That's how much, you know, how, how much the elite are afraid of people's discontent. They're actually spending, you know, gazillions of dollars. That's tens of billions a month. Number two, after military spending, on making sure that people stay in line on every level of society. Because what used to happen in the 1960s and early 1970s, the protests and so on and so forth, that is no longer the case. You have an occasional thing here or there, but a generalized thing. Because this is a country of 330 million people, and you know, there's a lot of simmering, you know, anti-government you know, protest on every level. Sure, but they're using high-tech brainwashing to pacify the public. They're using every way possible to pacify, to pacify the public, you know. There's a lot of games being played, and if you kind of look at what's going on in America itself, there's a lot of not only race wars, but there's a lot of fighting between, you know, groups of people and races, blacks and whites, men against women, you know, you have, uh, you know, Indians against the, the Pakistanis, you know, you have the Arabs against the, 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 you know, the blacks, and all of this kind of stuff, you know, the police against, you know, everybody else. All this kind of stuff is, I have no doubt at all, is orchestrated from behind the scenes because while you're fighting each other, you don't keep your eye on the bigger price, which is, you know, survival of the planet itself at the cost of these super. Sure, so bottom line, uh, the world government is being built, the Pope's out there endorsing it, uh, but at the cost of the planet itself. I mean, they may get world government for about a minute and then blow it up. It's, uh, it certainly doesn't look good. It's a very, very, very scary situation, especially as you don't have, you know, the politicians that we had in the world in the 60s and the 50s, or actually even the Bilderbergers who built Bilderberg, you know, in 1954 and the early 1960s, the people who came out of the, you know, early, late 19th century, or 20th century, they're not there anymore. Now you have the people who are running the show. You have, you know, the crazy kooks who were born after the Second World War, you know, the baby boomers, and they certainly don't have the gravitas of, you know, the Rockefellers and the Jacksons and the Prince Bernard's and, you know, and, and, the, uh, and, and these individuals who actually put Bilderberg on the map.
And so that's why we have the situation that we have that we're in because the older generation, the Kissingers were, you know, 90, you know, the Rockefellers who just turned 100, the Brzezinski, the, the Schultz, you know, these people are old or dead or dying. And so they're completely out of the picture. Or they're just about to be out of the picture. And everybody else who basically runs the show right now certainly doesn't have this long, you know, uh, the distant tunnel vision that these others had way back Well, sure. That was my final question. DanielEstland.com. I can't wait to get you on your new film. Four or five years in the making comes out. I've seen some of the cinematography, the trailer, truly amazing. Uh, David Rockefeller did just turn 100 uh, on June 12th. I didn't even know that. It just seems like yesterday he was 94 and put out memoirs. Uh, has I'm told David Rockefeller has faded. That's why Senator Rockefeller retired to take over the reins. For those that don't know, David Rockefeller has been there since his father set up the UN and the entire global government infrastructure i mean is anybody in modern world history more important than david rockefeller and what's the word on him well you know he's, he's completely out of the picture he's a hundred so you know it's uh i don't think he's altogether intellectually can be altogether certainly gaga is you know is uh I don't think he'll be going to any public meetings. I don't think we'll be seeing very much of him because of this kind of, you know, this advanced age. <clears throat> Even if, you know, we just put a fixed uh, heart transplant in, but, you know, it doesn't make any difference. When you're 100, you're 100. Nature, you know, doesn't give time out and he's out of the picture. But again, him being out of the picture only means that there's nobody else taking over the reins, so to speak, of organizations such as Bilderberg. And also sure. the fact that there's no new blood. There's the people who are there. They all, you know, they all come from the same walks of life. They all talk to each other the same kind of language and as they're in a bubble they're in a bubble they're in a bubble they're smoking That's their own right. dope exactly alex they're in a bubble and that means that you know there's going to come the time not too long from now if we're still around that Bilderberg is going to be completely you know irrelevant simply because the people who are there they simply don't understand how the world works beyond you know the four walls that they operate within Amazing. Well, I can't, when is your film coming out? I mean, I've seen clips of it. The film is done. Yeah, we just needed to put the uh, this last little bit of the Bilderberg meeting itself into the film, and it's finished. And we're going to be premiering in the United States in September. Well, I want to get you on then. Uh, anytime you want to come on, uh, we'd love to have you. Thank you, Daniel Lessel, and amazing information. Thank you. Sure. That is Take a true. Care. Thank you, sir. That's a true investigative journalist right there of the highest caliber.